So good afternoon. I am Marcia Ferranto. I'm the CEO of the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund. Thank you for joining us today for our 2020 Mid-Year Fatalities Report, one of the two most important conversations we will have over the next 12 months. The second one is coming in January in conjunction with the publication of the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum Year-End Fatality Report. We have been publishing our mid-year and annual law enforcement fatality reports for nearly 30 years. Each year, the numbers have been reflective of what was happening in our country, as well as trends in crime. But today marks the first publication of the report that will be followed by an in-depth discussion about ways we can approach reducing law enforcement fatalities and make serious advances to getting the numbers trending downward. I would like to spend a moment and tell you about our Destination Zero initiative. Destination Zero is leading the way in officer safety and wellness by becoming the national repository of all best practice practices being utilized around the nation. With hundreds of programs created and sourced at destinationzero.org and by offering special recognition from the most successful programs, we are well on our way to establishing new protocols that will protect our law enforcement heroes. None of this would be possible without partners like Verizon, who is the leading sponsor of our Destination Zero program. Verizon's funding makes it possible for us to collect data, create innovative training programs, recognize and honor those who are creating best practices, and ultimately, Verizon's support helps us to continue to serve the safety and wellness of law enforcement, and as a result, we work together in an effort to keep names off the wall. As the country's leading authority on all line of duty deaths, it is incumbent upon us to serve our country and our law enforcement officers in a greater way. It is not enough to just report the data. It is our duty to do more. Today, for the first time, we bring to you some of the greatest thought leaders in law enforcement whose experience, innovation, and program development has impacted and saved the lives of our law enforcement officers from all around the country. Allow me to share with you some of our mid-year numbers. We have had 65 line of duty deaths in the first half of 2020. This is a 14% decrease over 2019 when 76 deaths were reported. Firearms related fatalities were the leading cause of line of duty deaths. 2020 had 27 firearms related deaths compared to 28 in 2019. This represents a 4% decrease. Traffic deaths increased 8% with 26 deaths compared to 24 last year. Nine of the traffic related deaths were automobile crashes and nine were, str were were struck while on the side of the road. Seven were single vehicle crashes and one was a motorcycle crash. This data is particularly troubling because nationwide traffic has been lower than usual during this time period due to COVID-19. Other causes of death remain the same, 2020 as in 2019. There were 12 line of duty deaths attributed to other causes the same number as last year. These deaths include heart attack, stroke, and deaths from 9-11 related illnesses. It is important to note the COVID-19 pandemic will play a significant part in our year-end fatality report numbers. So far, there are five confirmed line of duty deaths related to COVID-19, however, another 53 cases are pending review. If these cases are also confirmed, COVID-19 would surpass 
all other cases of death. Texas and California have the highest number of officer deaths so far this year. Texas has 11 line of duty deaths. California has five and several states have had three fatalities each. At this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Acting Director, Mike Costigan. Mike is Acting Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and previously served as Chief of Staff for the Office of Justice Programs. Mike has worked extensively on public safety issues throughout his career. He ran Virginia Exile, the administration's statewide gun violence reduction effort. That program became known as Project Safe Neighborhoods and is the current administration's top gun violence reduction effort. Thank you, Mike. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today and to be part of the release of the National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial Fund's annual mid-year report. This year's release is quite a bit different with the addition of this uh, new and exciting panel. Uh, BJA has always held as one of its top priorities law enforcement safety and wellness. It is our goal and mission to support our nation's law enforcement by providing innovative and current resources, training and technical assistance to improve our officers' physical safety and mental and emotional wellness. One of the many ways that BJA is doing this is through our Destination Zero program, a component of our Valor Officer Safety and Wellness Initiative. For the past six years, Destination Zero has identified innovative and promising officer safety and wellness programs that law enforcement agencies have developed and successfully implemented within their agencies and departments. Many of these programs are highlighted on the DestinationZero.org website, which also provides resources and information that other agencies can use to implement similar programs within their departments. Destination Zero has also given annually National Officer Safety and Wellness Awards to the top four agencies in the country in the areas of general officer safety, officer traffic safety, comprehensive officer safety, and officer wellness. Today, we are honored to have a pair of these Destination Zero Award winners, along with members from the Destination Zero Selection Committee and subject matter experts to share with us their innovative and successful programs to reduce line of duty deaths and increase officer safety and wellness. BJA, the Department of Justice, and this administration have made officer safety and wellness a top priority. And we are committed now more than ever to continuing our work in supporting our nation's officers. I wanna thank Marcia Ferrando, uh, obviously the CEO of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund for this mid-year report of officer fatalities and the great work they are doing in the area of officer safety and wellness. I wanna thank our panelists for their proactive work and dedication in improving law enforcement safety and wellness. I'm sure you will all find today's panel incredibly informative. Uh, at this point, I will kick it back to Marsha and thank you again for inviting me. This is a, a great honor. Unfortunately, our day is, is uh, shaping up to be a rough one, so I may not be able to stay as long as I had hoped but I will try to stay for some of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Director, and I know you're busy, and thank you for carving out this time for us this afternoon. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, John Matthews. John is the Senior Director of Safety and Wellness for the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial and Museum and a former police chief. John has developed many federal programs for the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, multiple presidential initiatives, and served as a White House advisor. Currently, he also serves as a member of the DOJ Officer Safety and Wellness Working Group and serves on the National Consortium on Preventing Law Enforcement Suicide. So John, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Marcia, and, and we appreciate all of the support. Uh, 
Memorial Fund gives for not only the media report and the numbers, which are so important, but for the Destination Zero program. It's been a great partnership with BJO over the years. And for those watching and tuning in, we invite you to go to Destination Zero Dot org. That's where you're going to see our Safety Resource Center, uh, over 250 great programs. And we want law enforcement agencies all over the country to be able to replicate these programs. And also, um, we've got with us two of our National Officer Safety and Wellness Award winners today. Um, starting in October again, we'll start our application period for the 2021 awards. And out of the hundreds of agencies every single year that submit for these awards, as the director said, only four awards are chosen. So this is the best of the best. And let me get right to the panelists because that's who you want to hear from. From Sydney, Ohio, we have Chief Will Balling. And uh, Sydney, Ohio was a 2018 Comprehensive National Officer Safety and Wellness Award winner. That means they scored high in every single category and walked away with a comprehensive award. We also have with us today Sheriff Ryan Gardner. And Sheriff Gardner represents Lynn County, Iowa, which is our 2020 Comprehensive Award winner. Um, so it's great to have some of the old winners and new winners on with us today. Joining us from the DZ Selection Committee is Sheriff Ira Edwards, a good friend of mine, a five-term sheriff down in Clark County, Georgia. And Ira can speak to the fact, not only the proactive and innovative things that his agency are doing uh, to keep officers safe on the street and well, um, but he sees every single program that comes through as a member of the DZ Selection Committee and can really speak to um, not only how hard it is to select the awardees, but the diversity of the awardees. We, our awardees range from New York City Police Department and LA County Sheriff, all the way down to some of the smallest agencies in the country, 38 officers, 50 officers. And that's the key thing about Destination Zero is that agencies around the nation can repl uh, replicate these great programs. In addition to our law enforcement personnel, we've got Dr. John Scheinberg, and Dr. Scheinberg is a cardiologist and wears a law enforcement hat as a lieutenant at the Lakeway Police Department here in Texas, and Dr. Heather Silvio. She is a psychiatrist. She works in the area of mental health and PTSD, and Heather and I have been working with law enforcement officers and mental health for quite a while now. And uh, this is a, a, an awesome panel that we've got together. And today, what we want to talk about is we're going to start off talking about the traffic deaths. Again, as Marcia said, it's very disturbing with much of the nation plunged into COVID, with much of the traffic down across the country, our traffic fatalities are actually up about 8% this year. We're then gonna talk about our other line of duty deaths, heart attacks and stroke. We're going to finish our traditional discussion with firearms fatalities. And we're gonna talk about that huge looming issue of 2020 and that's COVID-19 and the havoc that it's wreaking on our law enforcement personnel. But let me start off with our traffic uh, stats. Uh, as I said, we're up about 8% this year, struck by incidents where officers were hit while outside the vehicle uh, is the leading cause of death in that category. And I'm going to bring right into the discussion Sheriff Brian Gardner from Lynn County. Sheriff Gardner, your agency was the 2020 Comprehensive Award winner, and you've done a lot in the area of traffic safety. I know one of your really innovative programs is training your deputies out in Hawkeye Motor Speedway. But if you can comment a little bit on traffic fatalities and again, what you're doing and what agencies across the country can do to replicate your success and reduce this type of line of duty deaths. Sheriff? Sure. Thanks, John. I, I think one of the things that's really important for law enforcement executives when it comes to safeguarding their personnel um, is to make sure that traffic safety, uh, the traffic safety component is in the forefront. Um, and so, uh, as you stated, we are fortunate that we do have Hawkeye Down Speedway here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, it has a quarter mile and a half mile uh, paved track with banking. 
and uh, Hawkeye Downs um, has been gracious enough to allow us to utilize their facility um, in the past for our EVAC uh, operations. So we utilize our Academy certified driving instructors and then we'll spend several days out at Hawkeye Downs and uh, they will allow us to utilize driving, some defensive driving, and uh, that, that's very, very handy for our folks to actually put them behind the wheel with the instructors right there present to make sure that what they're doing is appropriate. Um, as you know, um, you know, officers spend a lot of time behind the wheel, and it's important that uh, we train them uh, with, with that, that task in mind. You know, we're always good to go out and, you know, shoot our firearms as required, and we do the CPR and first aid training and everything else. But as far as the training for behind the wheel time, I think that's of utmost importance to make sure we're doing that. Um, I will have to add that having a racetrack uh, for law enforcement officers is not necessarily unique to Cedar Rapids. The Iowa Law Enforcement Academy in, in Des Moines is actually very close to Newton, which is home of Iowa Speedway. And so Iowa Speedway um, has been gracious enough to allow the recruits as they come through ILEA to uh, go out and use their track as well. So we just kind of piggyback that here locally. Um, and and it's, it's working very well for our officers. And we have a lot of good comments because of that. It's a great partnership. And that's what we look for is those public-private partnerships. And having the guys go out there. And as you said, these deputies are out in their squad car eight hours a day driving around and yet some agencies once you graduate the academy you have almost no driver training whatsoever unless it's defensive driving so i think it's critically important that that you have placed an emphasis on the driver training and and let me let me commend you sheriff i know that uh, the Iowa standards on training are fairly minimal, like most of the states in this country. And even with that, though, Sheriff Gardner has dedicated nearly 140 hours each year to deputy training. What, what, what impact does that training have for your agency, Sheriff? Well, one of the things that we were pushing for as I ran for elected office is to increase the hands-on training that our deputies receive. You know, we, we do the Police One programs and things like that, like many agencies do, um, but we wanted to also push out more hands-on training. And certainly the feedback from the deputies was, was absolutely positive. You know, we're, we're out at the range more frequently, we're behind the wheel more frequently. You know, anytime we can get officers to be involved in hands-on training, we find that they retain that training uh, better that they uh, they're more obviously more involved in the training um, we, we think that that's it's more bang for our buck um, we end up spending most of uh, that time on overtime for our staff the way that the way that we have the minimum staffing set up but we also find that that's overtime money well spent and well used and, and certainly well used well worth the effort to do it Excellent. Very good. Thank you, Sheriff. I want to turn our attention to Chief Balding over in Sydney, Ohio. And as I said, Sydney is a 2018 Comprehensive National Officer Safety and Wellness Award winner. And, and we appreciate our, our winners being with us today. But, um, Will, you and I have talked before about how important traffic safety is to you and your agency. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives that you're doing to try to keep your officers safe from basically what has been the leading cause of death for I think 15 of the last 17 years, Chief? Uh, yes, thank you, John. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, as John mentioned, we won the overall comprehensive in 2018. We actually finished second in 2017 for the health and wellness part. And that gave my officers more drive and incentive to actually improve our programs. So I want to thank Destination Zero and the Valor Program and BJA for all of that. Uh, with traffic, I think it really starts with a culture. And that's how we broke it down. It starts even before the officers get in the car. For an officer, you have to explain the why. Why is traffic safety important? Why are officers getting hurt out there? What are the leading causes? Our officers are inquisitive, so we sat down as a department and kind of looked at the stats that we got from the National Foundation and looked at all the stats out there, what was actually getting them killed and broke it down that way. We focused a little bit on the traffic stops before actually officers made the stops. We wanted them to go quick, but not be in a hurry. And basically when they saw a violation, I wanted them to take the time to notify dispatcher run the license plate to find out what they could about that driver or the owner of the vehicle. Let other officers know where they were in the area. 
again, doing everything quickly, but not to be in so much of a hurry to get up to that driver's door. And then we kind of moved on to the focus of officers getting hurt by the side of the vehicle. There's too many tragic accidents, which are unfortunate, where a vehicle clips the officer on the side of the vehicle walking up to the driver's side. Uh, this was a huge culture change within our department. Again, it was starting with the why. Why make passenger side stops? We wanted them to move around to the passenger side when it was safe to do that, to avoid the oncoming traffic. But once we started doing that, the officers started seeing they could see more things inside the vehicle. They found out they had more violations of stolen property or illegal drugs or open containers just by getting that better look inside that vehicle. So we wanted to focus on moving around to the passenger side and explain that. We also just looked at their driving in specific. What are we asking them to do inside the vehicle? Uh, we have computers inside the cars. We have cell phones inside the vehicles. We ask them to look for bad guys. We are the worst distracted drivers out there. So we looked at our own policies, a way we could keep the officers safe inside the vehicles and limiting some of that MDT use, limiting some of the distractions inside the vehicles. One of the other things we did inside the vehicle was actually from, I believe, a 2018 destination award winner that I stole their IDEL. They purchased these magnetic mics that hooked up the microphones magnetically in the cruiser to not take the officer's eye out. And yeah, I stole it. And that's a great thing about this program. I am not afraid to borrow, still acquire any other good programs out there and share it with anybody of what we're doing. And I think that's what makes this great. So we looked at that. And then we also looked at training. Uh, we do driver's training every single year like the sheriff does. <laughs> And I think I commend them for using the racetrack. We'd love to incorporate that. But again, slow speed training, even for our officers, we're finding it's reducing accidents and keeping guys healthier out there on the street. So there's a lot of things you can do. And the last thing we did that was kind of difficult, really, because we understand where officers' perspective are, but we have our supervisors review the use of pursuits, make sure we're doing them properly, make sure that we're not I hate to say pursuing them at all costs, because that's the culture I started with, and we kind of had to tell that back, but also reviewing some of their everyday driving, anything that got over 80 miles per hour inside our city, our supervisors take a quick pop in. Thankfully, we haven't had too many bad incidents, but the guys know that if they're doing 90 inside the city, they better have a really just cause for that. So again, a lot of this any department can do. We're a smaller agency, in Ohio, we're about average, but if you compare us to the Columbus Police Departments or the larger organizations, we're very small. But these are things anybody that can do with a little bit of training and a little bit of culture change, and they can make a big difference inside their organization. Fantastic. And I love how Sheriff Gardner spoke here about the emphasis on training and chief balling. You spoke about changing the culture and, and uh, two different ways to tackle the same problem. And, and again, I think most importantly, and I love the commercials for DZ, thanks, Will. But, um, you know, Sydney was a 2017 finalist, went back, went back and looked at what other organizations were doing across the country. They looked at our DZ winners and they said, how can we improve? How can we make it as safe as possible? In the end of the day, it's not about winning an award and being a winner or a finalist. It's about keeping officers safe, keeping officers healthy, keeping officers alive. And I really commend you for, for going to the next level, both of you, um, and keeping your officers safe. I, I'd like to turn our attention for just a minute to Sheriff Ira Edwards. And Ira and I were talking uh, earlier this week, and he was telling me about a program that they have with the Department of Transportation and how they're keeping their officers safe on the roadways. Sheriff Edwards, can you tell us a little bit about your program? Yes, John. First of all, thank you all for inviting me uh, to be a part of this mid-year report. Um, we're not a full service agency, uh, we, so therefore uh, we don't do a lot of traffic, but we do have a lot of details when it comes to the University of Georgia games. Go dogs, by the way. And also uh, uh, the DOT, the Department of Transportation, um, they're in the process of uh, repaving the entire loop here uh, within the Athens Clark County. And that is about a, a four month uh, detail. 
So with that said, uh, and it's at nighttime, so it's a 12 hour shift, uh, basically during the nighttime. And so uh, one of the things, some of the things, some of the many things that we are doing, and uh, as you all had mentioned, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you just look at uh, some of the best practices that are going on, and then you kind of glean from that. And, and some of the things that we've taken away is, first of all, uh, all of our road deputies are issued a Viz Guard traffic vest. And that vest uh, really lights up like a Christmas tree for the most part during the night when the light shines on it. So we really, really want to make sure that they are visible. Um, and as uh, Chief Ballin had mentioned, uh, that passenger side stop, uh, we, we, we are definitely uh, staying on that side as well, making sure that we are keeping our deputies outside of that, that uh, ongoing traffic. Uh, one of the things that we also have, and you may not be able to see it, uh, but this is made by Dorsey, and this is a Dorsey lead signal light traffic baton. And it is a multi-type uh, use. Uh, it has a flashlight on it. Uh, you know, it, it'll blink off and on. It'll, it'll it just, you know, it's like Christmas all over again. So, so, and it's very, very, very visible during uh, the night, nighttime. So these are some of the things that we are doing um, uh, by using this light in particular. All of my deputies are, are issued that particular light. And as I mentioned, you know, University of Georgia games, uh, when they're having their night games, uh, it is so important because you're talking about anywhere between 100,000 fans that are coming in on top of the 128,000 population that we already have. So, uh, so one of the things that we try to keep in mind is uh, officer safety uh, because we want them to go home at the end of the day uh, because they have loved ones as well. So these are some of the things that we are doing, uh, John. Yeah, Sheriff, one of the other things you mentioned uh, is uh, some policy changes, um, like mandating that there's at least two officers on each of these traffic details. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that is correct. Uh, we, in, in order for any of our uh, deputies to work any type of uh, special detail as it relates to traffic, there has to be at least two officers with two additional units. And, and once again, the purpose of that is to keep that visibility present, uh, to let the ongoing traffic uh, uh, know that uh, there's a construction ahead and so that they are able to slow it down a tad and to make sure uh, that, that they are seeing us and that we are visible. And once again, so at the end of the day, we are able and my deputies are able to go home Right, and fantastic. You know, right here in three different short discussions, we talked about training as essential. We talked about a change in culture, equipment, and policies and procedures. And if we're going to reduce officer line of duty deaths and fatalities across the country, we've got to work in all of these areas. We've got to work in policy, procedure, training, equipment, um, in, in changing the culture so that the mindset is, we're going to go home every single night. So I think these are some great recommendations. I've been taking notes. I hope others are taking notes uh, from some of these successful programs. I want to turn now to our second uh, category in the report, and it's our other uh, category. And the other category consists of heart attacks. It consists of strokes, our 9-11 deaths, and eventually we're add COVID-19 deaths to that. But I want to stick with our traditional um, categories there with other heart attacks and strokes. And I want to bring in Dr. John Scheinberg. And Dr. Scheinberg, um, even though COVID-19 seems to be the story of 2020, we need law enforcement to realize that our officers are still dying in the line of duty of these traditional types of, of medical issues. And, and, and tell us a little bit about what some of these issues are and how we can be proactive to keep our officers well and alive out there on the street, doctor. Okay, John. So <clears throat> the first thing I just wanted to kind of expound on, on what you're saying is, you know, we look to save lives. We look to keep names off the wall. And there are certain things that are low hanging fruit. There's things that we can get very easily. And to kind of put this in perspective, I want to just set the stage here. So uh, the other panelists and the listeners understand what we're looking at. Heart disease may come in on the, um, on the Osterdown Memorial page 
or as a, as a death is the number two or number three item every year. However, that doesn't capture the heart attacks that happen off duty and it doesn't happen the heart attacks, it doesn't capture the heart attacks that are not fatal. So when someone has a cardiac event, they have a heart attack, the, um, the conditions that put that plan in motion didn't start at the moment that individual had a heart attack. It started months, weeks, days, hours before the heart attack occurred. There's nothing magical after that 6 p.m. shift ends or that 8 p.m. shift ends when that individual officer leaves that their heart attack risk stays at the office with them. Now, you can look at the death for pursuit and gunfire and um, all the other things that we come in, you know, occupationally, ha occupational hazards that we are that have that drops off rather precipitously, but heart attacks don't. So when you extrapolate the data that we collect and you extrapolate for a 24 hour period and realize that only we're capturing 3% of the heart attacks, this is a substantial issue. And it's so substantial that if you look at the frequency of heart attacks, the average age of a cop with a heart attack we used to believe it was 49. New data published earlier this year shows it's down to 46. A large chunk up to 45% happened under the age of 45. And if you look at our life expectancy, it's 22 years less than the general population. A cop's life expectancy in the United States is 57 compared to 79. And the terrible thing is the average age of retirement of a law enforcement officer is 57. So that is the scope of the problem. So it's one thing to talk about what the issue is. The second thing is to talk about why we see the issue. And then of course, the third thing is how do we prevent this from happening? Because that's the focus here is keep these names off the wall. Why does this happen disproportionately to this group of people? The quite honest answer is we don't really know. We have some ideas. First off, it is a interesting stress pattern. So people will ask me all the time as I travel all over the the country and I sit on the, the, the uh, officer safety working groups regarding this and they say, oh, it's cops are under stress. And, and I tell you, we're under stress as cops, we're under stress as doctors and nurses and people who deliver pizza. This is a stressful time. Everybody's under stress. But our stress pattern in law enforcement is different. We have a pattern which is 98% boredom followed by 2% sheer terror. And when that adrenaline kicks in, whether it's physical from a uh, use of force, whether it's mo emotional when a, when a call comes in, an officer down, when it's during a high speed pursuit, certain physiological changes happen. There's a rapid increase in heart rate and blood pressure. There's repeated Valsalva in which the officer bears down without breathing. Those of us who've gone through defensive tactics will very well remember as we do it, the instructors are typically yelling, breathe, breathe, because it's, it's common for us not to. You have a conversion from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, and you're using both sides of your body, left and right hemispheres of your brain, and your upper and lower body. So all these things are engaging at once. The adrenaline dump makes the plaque and the arteries unstable, which leads to heart attack. So we have that risk. You put that on top of a group of people who most of the civilians don't realize, it's a very sedentary profession. It's a diet of convenience, and especially in departments that are busy. It's shift work, and all of these things lead to an increase in obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and prediabetes. And you take that risk and you throw on top of it those adrenaline dumps, and it's a recipe for disaster. So we see the problem. We know some of the causes. Now we have to look at those causes and try to address each one of them. And that's where the safety and wellness initiatives come in. The problem that we have with wellness initiatives is it's a very difficult term to define. And if we can't define it, we can't talk about it. Because you can talk to everyone on this panel who are experts in their fields and you ask them to define wellness and everyone will define it a little bit differently depending on their own perspective and experience with that. So what we've done, and John, you know, you and I sit on these, these task force in Washington, and what we've done is we really looked at, there's really five different areas of wellness, no matter how we gauge it and however the conversation is geared at the moment, we're talking about trauma, TCCC, so combat casualty care, 
We're talking about cardiac screening because of the data that I just mentioned. We're talking about fitness because we know that fit cops are less likely to be injured, less likely to have uh, individual and departmental liability, less likely to use lethal force. We talk about nutrition and weight loss because we see the statistics of the large percentage of cops that are overweight and obese. And we talk about the mental health component because we know that our officers are at increased risk for mental health issues, suicide, divorce rates are high, substance abuse rates are high, PTSD is off the charts, and it's not enough. And I know our psychologist will, will really wax yeah. on this, but it's not. And John, I was going to say, I, I want you in just a second to kind of talk about, you know, some of the, you and I have discussed the various tests that we can the preventative tests. I want you to talk about that in a second, but since you did bring up mental health, let me bring Dr. Heather Silvio in the conversation. And, and Heather, with all that John just described, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't believe we don't have more problems than we do. Um, how do we deal with, with all of these stressors in, in law enforcement, Heather? Of course, thank you. And I wanna echo what everyone else said about, um, I'm glad to be here and to be part of this to help keep those names off that wall. Um, I pretty much agree with almost everything that Dr. Scheinberg said. And I think the key piece to all of it is never forgetting that physical and emotional health are flip sides of the same coin. They are not distinct from each other. And I think sometimes we look at that. And so for me, in terms of mitigating a lot of those issues, there are three places where you can actually work to prevent negative outcomes. It's before something happens, while something is happening and after something happens. And those all take slightly different pieces. So before something happens, that's what we in psychology typically call resilience. It's the idea that I am giving myself the tools and ability so that when something happens, I can get through it a little bit easier. And that pulls in a lot of the stuff Dr. Scheinberg was talking about. You know, if my body is healthy, that gives me a step up. So if I'm eating well and I'm sleeping well and I'm staying physically active, all of that will help me to better handle things like adrenaline dumps and stuff like that. So prior, you want to be really doing everything that you can. And then as he said, that's of course much easier said than done. And so it is important that there's a lot of a lot of departments who are actively looking at wellness programs to help officers. Things like helping them plan so that instead of it being convenience eating, I think at the beginning of the day, can I make some sandwiches for myself? Can I put some fruit in my trunk? What are some simple things that I can do that will help me through that day? So that's kind of that prevention piece. When it's actually during an event, this is when we start relying on a lot of the techniques actually that officers learn and don't realize they're learning when they learn things like de-escalation. Things like taking a breath, taking a step back, remembering your goal in being there, remembering the, the purpose, and that the person that you're talking to is a human, right? And, and keeping all of that in mind, and so we're better able to handle exactly what's happening in that moment. And then, of course, after the, after the fact, that's when we're dealing with both the physical side of it. So I've had that huge adrenaline dump. My body has to process all of that. So I'm processing the physical side of it, which I'll leave to Dr. Scheinberg to talk about, but then also the emotional side of it. What did I see? What did I experience? What can I do with that? And there are a lot of agencies who are working on that as well. Different ways setting up peer support, just letting folks know that they're there. When I teach classes with law enforcement, a lot of what I talk about in my trauma section is watching for changes in other people and then being open to it, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I'm a little concerned, it seems like you're acting differently than you did before. It's very, very difficult. I'm obviously not law enforcement, but I am a veteran and it's very similar mindset, you know, suck it up buttercup, right? So if somebody says something to you that they're concerned, what is our typical response? Oh, no, no, man, I'm fine being open to hearing that from somebody and being willing to say that to somebody, you know, offline, not making necessarily a big deal about it, but help being there for each other because we are our own best resources. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Silvio. I mean, that, that's some great advice there. I mean, and, 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 and take that to heart, the resiliency piece and dealing with it in the moment. And we have a lot of Destination Zero applicants that are providing peer, peer support and mental health. I, I want to go back to Dr. Scheinberg for a minute. And, and John, I, I, you know, you and I have talked before about some of the tests that you can take that, that, that I, I know you've told me every officer needs to take these tests. So talk about that a little bit. And then what are some recommendations that you have overall to keep us healthy out there? Okay. So first, let me answer your question by telling you what doesn't work. What doesn't work are treadmill testing. So a lot of departments will take an officer who has no symptoms, feels well, and before a promotion or a move to a special operations unit, we'll put them on a treadmill, do an old-fashioned stress test. The American College of Cardiology specifically says, you know, stress testing in an asymptomatic or a person who has no symptoms has no utility. A stress test will only pick up blockages when they're bad enough to obstruct blood flow. At that point, the horse out of the barn. We have to find these individuals when they have the very early stages of blockage. It's very easy to do. So when blockages form, there are two specific things that will happen to the arteries. The first thing is those arteries will become calcified. So the plaque forms in the wall of the artery, the artery develops little flecks of calcium, and those flecks of calcium are very easily picked up by doing a calcium score, which is a very low dose radiation CT scan. It's called the coronary calcium score. They're marketed all over the country in multiple different names, a heart saver CT scan, a CAC, a CAC score, a CCS, which is a coronary calcium score. But this is an inexpensive CT scan. It usually runs about 75 bucks. Individual lies down on the scanner with his or her clothes on and goes in and out in about 30 to 45 seconds. That scan is able to detect the early stage of blockage formation. So that's the first thing. The problem is we're publishing data on about 4,500 cops in Central Texas and Oregon that we've looked at, and this marker is not enough. It has to be paired with another marker, which is found on a blood test. Because the other thing that happens when blockages form is the arteries will become inflamed. And interestingly, it's that inflammation that leads to heart attack. And there's several markers of inflammation that can be measured. One in particular, which is now a generic, very reasonably priced and very highly available test. I'm going to give you the long name for it, then I'm going to give you the abbreviation. The long name is phospholipase A2. We abbreviate it as LP, as in Paul, dash P as in Paul, L as in Lima, A as in alpha, with a number two as a subscript. LP, PLA2. It's a very simple blood test that detects blockage as that blockage is becoming inflamed, leading to heart attack. What we found by studying thousands and thousands of law enforcement officers, that about 50% of the cops have either plaque in the arteries manifested by calcification or plaque in the arteries manifested by this inflammatory marker. And it's statistically higher than the civilian counterparts even at cops in their youngest ages in their late 20s. So this is something that is detectable and easy to identify. And, and fantastic. Uh, and you said, uh, Dr. Seinberg, that these are inexpensive. I mean, for, for literally less than $200, you can take these tests and know where you stand and prevent uh, maybe having a heart attack or a stroke. And I, I hope the agencies out there listening wrote it down. If not, you can go to the recording that We'll post on the DC website, but the uh, coronary calcium score and the blood test, LP, PLA2, uh, easy test that you can do. To, to finish up this section on, on other uh, law enforcement fatalities, I want to bring it back to Dr. Silvio. And, you know, we talk about the physical side a lot, Heather, but these officers also have families. Um, they're worrying about their finances, especially in these times. They've got extra jobs and so they've got all of these different stressors can you give us a couple of quick easy recommendations to kind of reduce that stress on our officers well probably the biggest thing that i recommend really to everybody is focusing on what you can control a big part of the stress that we end up putting ourselves under is focusing on things that are completely outside of our control 
And to some degree, it comes with the job description, right? Because you're trying to anticipate what may happen when you go on a call. Totally understand that. But then, does it stop there? No. To bring in what you were talking about, John, you start talking about or thinking about what might happen within my family? What's happening with my finances? Let me work this out, you know, 50 different options for what might happen. And a lot of it, we're creating it in our head. It, it isn't necessarily real. And I don't mean to minimize it because I completely understand. We all have families that we're concerned about. We have finances. Um, that is definitely, especially right now, um, as you mentioned. But not all of that has to be on our mind all the time. And so focusing on how can I problem solve this? What can I change about any of this? And it may not be an immediate answer. There may be, okay, I will start, what can I do today to make things better going forward? And then the, the single best way, in, in my opinion, for how to sort of structure your life is really trying to find a good work-life balance. Because a lot of the stressors come about because we get imbalanced. And when we start focusing too much on one and not the other, a lot of those stressors start to boil over. And, and, and now great, yeah, I'm sorry. Great, adv great advice, uh, Heather. And, and Ira and I have talked about that. Ira is also an ordained minister, if I remember correctly. And, and that work-life balance has got to be so important. Ira, give us a little bit of uh, how you maintain that. You've been in this business, uh, what, 37 years, I think. That's a long run. Yeah, well, you know, as you had mentioned, and, <clears throat> you know, I I try to keep it simple. You know, I, it's, it's, it's faith, family, and then job. That's how I look at it. Faith, family, and then job. Uh, I, I'm fortunate to have been married over 37 plus years. And I tell you, I have a wife that holds me accountable. That's first of all, <laughs> I was on vacation, on, <laughs> was on vacation on yesterday in uh, Destin, Florida. And the first thing she said when we got up, okay, let's go walk about three miles. So, you know, when you have that accountability, accountability partner, even when you don't feel like it at times, but you know that you need to make it happen. Um, you know, one of the things that really pushed me, uh, John, is when I lost uh, two of my deputies as a result of a heart attack. Matter of fact, I, there was, I had one of my deputies to have a heart attack uh, last week while on the job. Uh, we were fortunate and blessed to, uh, to have had a, uh, a medical staff in-house because we have actually a, a, a medical hospital within our jail that uh, caters to our inmates. So, uh, but he was able to, uh, to, to, he was okay at the end of the day, but they were able to take care of him. But these are the kind of things, John, that I look at and I go, okay, lessons learned, what can we do uh, to, to make it better? And I'm also excited and uh, happy to report that the athens Clark County government, we are really, really big on this. We call it the athens Clark County wellness program and and it, and it focuses on four things the first thing is uh, prevention and screening the second thing is physical activity you know get out there and do something do something and thirdly we've got to look at the nutrition piece of it you know what are you eating you know we, we all like a piece of fried chicken every now and then but you can't eat that stuff every day <laughs> unfortunately you cannot eat it uh, and so uh, it, it comes to just, just, just uh, at the end of the day, health education. Uh, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to say, okay, what are we going to do? We know why it's happening. So what are those steps that we're going to put in place in order to, to have not only a healthy officer, uh, but, but a healthy community in general? Um, and we also give our our uh, team members and employees incentives. Uh, we pay you to exercise. You can make an additional up to about $500 extra uh, just by whether it's mowing the lawn or whether it is going to the gym. It doesn't matter. We're saying keep it moving. Keep it moving. And by doing so, uh, you know, it's going to help you in the moment.
So these are some of the things that we are doing. And I would encourage also uh, our, our listeners out there to go to our website. Uh, and it's, you can just uh, Google athens Clark County, uh, myaccgovwellness.org. And you can basically see uh, the, the awesome uh, innovative program that we are doing. And of course, you know, it's, it's pretty tough to, to, to get some of our officers uh, to see the big picture because we've all, all been stigmatized by being that person that stops by Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and get the coffee. So, so, but we've just got to change that mindset. And that was the game changer for me when I saw two of my deputies. Uh, one actually had a heart attack and died while he was on duty. And then another one actually died uh, while uh, he, was, he was exercised. Well, so, as a member of the selection committee, you certainly know we've seen this over and over again. Um, the applications come in and the very first paragraph says, because we lost an officer to fill in the blank, traffic death, fire right. death, right. Uh, heart attack, we decided to start this program. And, and we want agencies to start now, to start today, to build their program, to enhance their program, and not wait until they lose an officer. We've got several questions coming in now, and I want to turn this back to, to Chief Balling first, and then I'm going to shoot it over to you, Brian. Um, Will, you were a wellness finalist before you were a comprehensive winner. Um, and one of the questions is, do you guys have a yearly fitness test? And if so, what is the test that you use? If you could address that, and then uh, Sheriff Gardner, the same for you. So Will, uh, do y'all have an annual test? Uh, yes, we've actually had a fitness test for about 20 years now. Um, we do both fitness and mental here at the department on our physical fitness test. Since we've had it about 20 years, it's basically been based on the Cooper standards. Um, so we've been doing it yearly. It's the same test as our new hires do. And our test programming is designed to measure both a uh, 300 meter run, mile and a half run, bench press, sit-ups, push-ups. Uh, same test as we give our entrance level. Officers can earn actually up to $1,700 if they pass it. And what we did on that number was kind of look at what we paid for educational incentive. because We wanted it to be the same for fitness as education. And the basis of our program, if somebody fails the test, we constantly improve, work with them. Uh, we try to get them trained events. We have a nutritionist that comes in and talks about eating the right foods at the right time. We want to do a comprehensive physical wellness test. Uh, they also get a complete physical every year on it. Uh, this was a tough sell to our city administration. One of the things I want to mention, you have to partner with a lot of people, your unions and your cities, to get these type of programs in. But we saw the benefit to keep officers healthy because if you do have that heart attack, if you do lose somebody to a physical fitness injury for a period of time, it costs a burden on the city administration and on others within the organization. So when you look at it, how much does it cost a department to not be healthy? It, it definitely outweighs where you're at with it being. One of the latest things we added to our physical fitness program is we have an athletic trainer on staff. Uh, this individual is a certified officer, but also works at the hospital to try to treat guys with injuries, hamstring pulls, different type of element, illnesses before they need surgery or that he works with them after they're injured. So we're seeing guys recover quicker, get them back on the street a lot quicker. But a lot of our programs to circle it back around is trying to prevent these injuries, prevent things from happening before they get out on the street and they have to go from sitting in a car for eight hours to chase after that 16 year old. So we've worked with them. The city's made a huge investment into it and we found outside partners to work in with our community to not cost anything. Yeah, that prevention aspect, yeah, I mean, we heard Dr. Scheinberg talk about it, Dr. Silvio, you talk about it. The prevention aspect with wellness is so, so important. Uh, Sheriff Gardner, I want you to kind of finish this conversation, just give us a little bit about what you're doing in the area of wellness, and then I want to turn to the firearms fatality. So, Sheriff? Sure. Well, we don't have a mandatory um, fitness program um, as far as fit tests every year. 
but we do, uh, similar to what Sheriff Edwards had, we do have an employee comprehensive wellness program. And uh, our program also pays employees for, for their participation. It's a, five, a $500 check. As long as they do, uh, there's, there's two main components. One is that they have to get the annual physical exam and blood work um, uh, through their family physician. And then also there is a series of wellness behaviors that uh, they need to participate in as part of the program. And not only do they get a $500 participation um, bonus, but also uh, we just worked out uh, through our collective bargaining that there is a reduction in their out-of-pocket insurance premium costs if they participate in that program as well. Um, and this is the first year we're going into that process as well. Um, you know, we have a, a full uh, functioning uh, fitness center in our building. We encourage people to do that. Um, you know, and not only do we do we concentrate on the physical fitness, but I think as Dr. Uh, Silvio had talked about, the, the mental wellness program is really important for us as well. In fact, through our collective bargaining, we now mandate annual mental health wellness checks for all of our sworn employees. And uh, we use a local EAP provider. Um, the deputies are required to do a checkup annually. Now, we have no idea what that checkup says. We just know that they've been there. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is look to see if there's any preventative measures that we could put in place to make sure that our employees are, are mentally aware. Much in the same way that you know, we've provided peer to peer counseling, we've provided Blue Courage training, you know, we've done the critical incident stress debriefing, all those things to help their mental and their physical wellness at the same time. Very good. And just kind of a little production note here. We said we were going to start taking live questions in three or four minutes. We actually have many questions pouring in. So I'm going to continue to address uh, the issues that we discussed and give you questions um, uh, as they come in to me for the remainder of the program. The final uh, traditional area that we track, the Memorial Fund, of course, is uh, firearms fatalities. Uh, firearms fatalities were down 4% in the first uh, 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 six months of this year, basically just one less death uh, than in, in prior months. Uh, the leading cause of the circumstance, and, and as, a, as a chief and someone that's been in law enforcement for, for 37 years now, it's always um, intriguing to me to find out, you know, how are these officers dying out there? Uh, you know, what is the cause and what is happening so that I can use it as a learning moment? And we know how domestic violence calls uh, are always high on the list, but for the first six months of 2020, more officers have died at responding to suspicious persons calls and suspicious activities than any other call for service. That, that's really interesting to me um, as a former chief because I want my troops to know that. I want them to understand that a simple call, a routine call, a call that we take thousands, tens of thousands of times a year. And right now in 2020, that's the leading cause of firearms fatality is something as inane as a suspicious person, suspicious activity call. Um, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Chief Gardner. You know, what are some of the things that you're doing out in your agency, uh, in addition to the training, you know, that are keeping your officers safe from a firearms perspective? So we're in the process of uh, purchasing a uh, judgmental use of force and de-escalation scenario simulator, a Virtra system. Um, and we're going to put that here so that not only do we spend, you know, at least four, if not five um, annual events uh, out at the range, you know, just live shooting, we want to be able to have something here that regardless of weather, regardless of, uh, you know, scheduling, we can pull officers in off the street and allow them to go straight to the simulator and we can talk about those judgmental use of forces um, that, that they, they have the ability to, to do that role playing right then and there. Um, and, and that's good uh, specifically when you can, you can program it to your suspicious person calls, your traffic stops, any of a number of things. And, and these days even more, I think important is the de-escalation component of, of, that, uh, of that, that process as well. And so, um, in addition to the, uh, you know, the active shooter training that we'd actually have out the live range, uh, things like that, the simulations, um, I think having the, the virtual system also is going to be very handy for our folks um, as we move forward for that type of training. 
Very good. And, and Chief Balling, I know that this is just so, so important to you and your agency. From a firearm standpoint and protecting our officers that are responding to those calls out there, what are some of the things that you're doing? Well, I think like the others, uh, we have the simulator training, we do extra training. We also have extra equipment in the vehicles. After Dallas shooting there, we put rifle protection vests in the cruisers. We also have tourniquets and medical devices inside the car, but we have a 911 bag that we call, call it. It's a small bag that has equipment that if there is a shooting incident, that the officer can grab it that has extra ammunition, that has compression bandages, that has to tourniquets and extra batteries for the radio in case there's a serious call, they can just grab and go with that. But as others said, and I kind of want to circle it back, and I know we're running shorter on time, but um, I think it all starts with before the officer gets in the car. This all goes back to both what the doctor said and Heather said, it starts with getting your head in the game first. So we talk about being ready to work. We talk about being physically fit, having that energy, having the physical capacity to handle anything. And then the mental capacity is your head in the game. Are you thinking about the job or are you thinking about a divorce or something else going on? So we offer that mental wellness check-ins too to build those relationships. But everything to start for a successful firefight starts even before you put your boots on. Are you ready to go? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you planning for the events? Are you thinking about things when you respond to the call? If you show up, even if you showed up thousands of times to these addresses on the same barking dog call, this thing could turn out bad. So we have to be left a bang when you show up. We have to take everything into consideration for that. We can have all the equipment and the training and the supplies I can give you and the procedures, but it still comes down, are we ready to do the job and change that culture and be ready to go when we put our boots on? The, the theme is the same in every category, whether it's traffic, other, or felonious, it's prevention, it's preparedness, it's physical fitness, it's uh, mental well-being, uh, and, and, and then your agencies for providing the equipment for structuring the culture. I, it's so important, uh, and, and I've thanked you uh, numerous times before everybody, uh, but, but Sheriff Gardner, there's one point I had in my notes that I can't let go here. You've given defibrillators to your officers that, you know, most agencies do that. That's a fairly common practice now. Um, Sheriff Edwards said how it was important with just his deputy last week. Um, but I have a note here since 2010, your deputies have received 10 life-saving awards for saving cardiac victims. Just, just tell us a little bit about that because we're not only talking about officers, we're talking about the citizens in the community you serve, correct? Right, absolutely. So even more these days, not only do we have the standard first aid kit, but we have the AEDs, now we're carrying Narcan. We've had some Narcan saves as well. Um, we have a commendation program at our office since we wanna recognize our deputies when they go and beyond in serving the community, and especially in these cases, and their life-saving efforts. So since 2010, we have uh, had 10 um, documented saves where our uh, deputies have used the AEDs appropriately, appropriately and successfully and have uh, 10 saves to their credit. Um, in addition, we have at last count, and I apologize if the number's off, I believe we have three Narcan saves as well where literally had the deputies not been there with the appropriate equipment in a timely manner and, and uh, provided it uh, appropriately, we probably wouldn't have these saves and these people wouldn't be able to, to remain in the community. So we like to recognize our folks. We have commendation awards we give to them. We have a formal presentation that we give uh, even during the roll call in front of their peers. We have another presentation we do at the county's uh, quarterly recognition breakfasts. And then I always put out uh, to the newspaper and media on an annual basis, a list of all those accomplishments, a list of all those commendation awards that our folks have. And finally, we are lucky enough that we have the, the State Sheriff's and Deputies Association has a magazine and we contribute uh, those, uh, those situations in article form uh, to the magazine as well. Very good, thank you. And before we turn to our COVID-19 discussion, uh, I wanna try to get caught up on some of these questions. We got lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, Dr. Scheinberg, uh, for some of the folks that tuned in a little bit late, one of the questions was addressing um, the treadmill, if you could, could talk about that again. 
It uh, also asked about a rowing uh, type physical exam. Um, can you just address what are the best cardiac exams out there uh, as far as from a preventative standpoint? Okay, so the differentiation has to be made between whether you're doing an exercise test to test fitness and functional capacity or a stress test to look for blockages. They're completely separate issues. So a stress test, a treadmill stress test, looking at an EKG is not a good cardiac assessment for people who are not having symptoms. However, we do know that we, we do need fitness assessments. And then the question which was earlier raised is, how do you do a fitness assessment? Is it a standard military type fitness assessment in which you do push-ups, sit-ups, and a mile and a half run? Is it a, is it a, um, a uh, obstacle or agility course? In Texas, the Texas DPS has really validated the Concept2 rower as a tremendous device for testing um, exercise potential because there's very low injury rate on it. They're actually quoting as almost zero. And, um, it simulates those things that I mentioned. It simulates aerobic to anaerobic transition. It simulates Valsalva. It simulates rapid increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and use of the upper and lower bodies. And the troops will argue when we put these things in that, oh, you know, we don't row after bad guys. And then the response is, well, we don't do push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, mile and a half run after bad guys either. But the reality is if we set up probably the most effective type of fitness assessment is an agility course which has obstacles that a patrol officer would come in contact with on a regular basis, it's effective. But the problem is you have a large group of people who don't train for it, who come out on the day of testing, and there's a tremendous amount of pulled hamstrings, twisted ankles, mm -hmm. and whatnot that we see on that. So the treadmill is a decent test. It's a fitness test. But again, the differentiation is it is not something we recommend for a cardiac screen to identify anyone who has a cardiac problem. These tests are phenomenal tests for fitness assessments. And I just wanna add one more thing, John, if I may. If we have a fitness assessment which is placed in service to a department, it's gotta have either a consequence or a reward. A fitness assessment that just says, go out and take this assessment, I've seen those tests operate, they're useless. There's no incentive. But if you tell the folks, hey, if you do well on this fitness test, you, we'll give you a little medal, Cops love all the shiny metals. We'll give you an extra 50 to 100 bucks in your pocket every month. If you don't make it, well, we'll remediate you. If you can't make a remediation, we're going to talk about a fitness for duty because there's a certain amount of fitness requirement it takes to do this job. So, again, um, they're all good tests when applied properly. Very good. Thank you. And I, I know that that addresses several questions that have come in uh, 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 over the last few minutes. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Silvio, one for you. Uh, we have a question that says, what can departments do to minimize officer stress? Um, when you talk about police culture, everything from the warrior mentality to reporting misconduct of fellow officers and, 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 and uh, even discrimination against other officers uh, or women working on the department. You know, what do you suggest, you know, what can departments do to minimize that stress? So that's a great question because this incorporates a lot of what we've already been talking about, about both prevention in the moment and after. Um, a lot of departments, one of the things John didn't mention is that currently I'm the deputy director of the Police Training Institute, and we do uh, law enforcement training around the country, and our program actually works on improving the relationship between law enforcement and community youth, and we address a lot of those issues, even though it's focused on youth, obviously it applies to communication and relationships with everyone, and so part of that is looking at yourself. And so for officers, helping them to understand that they don't have to buy into the us versus them, because that's what that boils down to. It, it really does. And it makes sense how that develops, because you're seeing people on their worst days. So of course, over time, you start to develop, or can start to develop this idea that there's this disconnect between you and the people that you're serving. And so, if I really start to internalize that, then it becomes an us versus them. And it is that warrior culture. We can do no wrong. There, you know, it's, 
we're, I'm just protecting my brothers and sisters in arms is, is essentially what can develop. And that isn't really very healthy. And so one of the things that's becoming more and more in the news is talking about accountability, talking about giving officers the skills, because it is a skill, but also the permission to be able to step up and say, I saw something I didn't agree with, without being put on suspension, without being fired, that sort of thing. And then related, but a separate question, the second part of what that the person asked, having to do with women and people of color, that a lot has to do with our implicit biases. Sometimes it's explicit, but often it's implicit. And um, I've actually been teaching, including with John, uh, teaching on implicit bias for years. Everybody has implicit bias. So teaching law enforcement officers that they are not unique, that they have implicit bias just like everyone else does, but looking at how do I bring it to the light so that I can mitigate it, so that I can actually make choices not based on an implicit bias, but that I can objectively explain why I made the choice I did, why I stopped the person I did, why I arrested the person I did, um, that kind of thing. So there's two pieces to it, um, but a big part of it is coming from leadership, letting the folks with their boots on the ground know that it is okay to acknowledge that we are all in this together and we all have these difficulties and we have to work together to solve them. Excellent, really appreciate the advice, Dr. Zobio. And I think that's gonna help a lot of agencies out as we move into the last question of this presentation. Uh, um, uh, Marsha uh, Ferrato at the very beginning of the presentation talked about deaths. And let me just kind of lay out to you the scope of the problem and the scope of the emerging problem. Uh, as of June 30th of uh, this year, we had five confirmed COVID related deaths. What does that mean? That means that our staff, working with the staff of law enforcement agencies that lost the officer, have been able to confirm a direct exposure between the officer and someone with COVID as the officer was executing his official duties. So the officer must be in the line of duty, executing their official duties. When they have contact with somebody from COVID, uh, they then get the illness and succumb to the illness. Um, as of June 30th, we've confirmed five of these cases. Probably even more disturbing, or more disturbing by far, is that we have reports from agencies, paperwork that is already in process of 53 more COVID-related deaths. And unfortunately, I'm hearing from my staff that the numbers may go even higher than that. And Dr. Scheinberg, I've got to turn to you first and, 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 and talk a little bit about how COVID is impacting law enforcement and what are some of the things that we can do? And then I'll kind of go around the panel. We'll just start with Will and go around the panel and tell me what some things you're doing in your agency. But but John, how officers still got to respond to calls for duty. They still got to make contact with citizens. How do we do that and stay safe? So, so John, it's, it's tough. You know, when you and I were, were chatting about this, the thing that I pointed out to you and uh, which as I said it, it was sort of, it had resonated with me as well. And that is, you have to remember, four months ago, we were talking about three to four people quarantined in Washington state. And now we have 3.4 million, despite shutting down the economies and whatnot. So the reality is this thing is here and it's coming. It's not stoppable. We can delay it. Here in Austin, we're a hotspot. Our hospitals are now overflowing with COVID. And we expect it to, you know, we'll have, we'll see this bell-shaped curve. So it is here. Um, the problem that we also have, so that's the first truth. The other, the second truth is we don't understand more than we understand. We don't understand full transmission. We don't understand why some people who are 30 years old and healthy die from it. And other people who are 75 with multiple medical problems walk out of the hospital a week later. So there's some other issue with the transmission and how effective this virus is in causing this autoimmune issue that we have, or this immune issue that we have. Um, there's no right answer outside of, you know, we, as cops, by the way, we can't stop serving the public. It's what we do, but it's the simple things. It's masks, 
It's contact precautions. It's using non-law enforcement people or uh, to handle non-law enforcement uh, issues that the law enforcement officers have traditionally handled. So selecting which engagements we use, but the reality is it's an inherent problem with our profession as it is a inherent problem with being a, a physician or anybody in the medical world. We just have to take the right precautions and stay on top of the data. And, and Chief Balling, you're a small agency and you and I have talked about some of the things that you put in place in your agency. And it's not just changing policies and procedures like taking some reports over the phone, it's letting your community know you're taking these measures to keep your officers safe and to keep them safe. So Will, tell me about some of the things you guys are doing to try to protect your officers and the citizens that you serve. One of the things we wanted to do was educate both groups. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns with this disease, and we still don't know what the true realities of it is, but we have to keep everybody safe. One of the things we did right away was come up with the policies and procedures with the officers, uh, reducing some of the non-important contacts with the public, uh, limiting some of those type of calls that we normally would go on in person and handle them over the phone. But when we did this, we wanted to utilize social media. We wanted to utilize other platforms to educate the public why we're doing this. Uh, we talked about taking more calls over the phone. It wasn't that we didn't want to see the public or we didn't take their calls seriously. We wanted to make sure both sides were protected. Our officers have to be in contact with a lot of people. Social distancing is not always something they can do. When there's a domestic going on, there's times they have to lay hands on people, arrest people, and fight people. And we don't know whether they're COVID positive or not at the time. So we wanted to educate the general public of what type of calls we could handle over the phone, what type of calls we could handle in person. And then if we did handle them in person, how we was taking the calls outside of the residence. So we didn't attract anything inside the residence and either contaminate them or the officers on the calls. So we did a lot of that joint partnership with the community. We also took the other precautions of cleaning the equipment, making sure the guys had their protective equipment that they needed, the masks, the gloves, anything that they had that they needed with hand sanitizer at the time. So a lot of it was trying to reassure them uh, we talk about stress. Well, this was a big stressor on the officers and the citizens. So we wanted to make sure we tried to reduce that as much as we could. And a lot of that was through education. Well, thank you. I mean, those are some great, great measures you talk about. But that key, that important piece of reaching out to the community and letting them know this is for your protection, too. If we don't need to come in the house, we're not going to come in the house. We're trying to keep both the officers and the community safe. And it's a learning curve for all of us, Chief. All of us are going through this. And, and just some of the points I was writing down as fast as I could. And that was another question that came up just a minute ago. All of this session, folks, if you're watching right now, it is being recorded. It will be posted on the Destination Zero website. You can go back and at your leisure, take notes. Uh, and write some of this information down because we are keeping that for you on the DC website. Um, Sheriff Edwards, I know you also run a jail and, and you are very proud of the fact that several months into this pandemic, uh, you have not had a COVID case in your jail. Can, can you tell us some of the precautions that you've taken because it's a major facility? Yeah, one of the things that uh, we were really ahead of the curve when it came to this COVID-19 uh, we got our, our mayor, our commissioners, our, all of our judges, and, and we just had a game plan. We, we were like, this thing is coming. So we, you know, we can't just uh, put our heads in the sand. And so one of the things that we begin to do as far as uh, uh, the judicial piece, as far as the inmates in the jail, we began to identify those inmates that were uh, low risk, no, nonviolent, and that were very, very close to uh, completing their sentences. And so what you have to keep in mind, when we initially, uh, this COVID-19 initially hit, we had about, our average daily population was about 350. And uh, today's uh, jail population, as far as the average daily population is about 225. 
So we were able to release over uh, 100 uh, inmates. And uh, the, the second piece of that puzzle is uh, when we get an, uh, an arrestee in, uh, of course, we're checking their temperature. We have designated a, um, a dorm for those that cannot bun out, and, and most of them do bun out. All of the ones that are basically coming in, for the most part, I would say about 95% of them are, are getting a bun. So, uh, and that's another thing. We're trying to make sure that we, we keep our jail population down. Mm -hmm. And just on last week, uh, the mayor and commission uh, voted, voted uh, that they made it, they passed an ordinance, a local ordinance that made it mandatory that everybody wear masks. So if you're coming into our community, uh, you, you've got to have a mask on. So uh, these are some of the steps that we're taking in order to try to, to stay on top of this, this, this COVID-19. Sheriff Gardner, I'm very, very good, Sheriff Edwards. Sheriff Gardner, I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, and what are some of the things that you're doing? You've got deputies on the road. You've got a jail. You know, this, this has got to be make a huge impact on your daily operations. What are some of the things that you're doing to keep these officers safe, especially in light of these really alarming statistics? If those 53 cases are indeed direct exposure, COVID-related deaths, then our numbers on this mid-year report are going to go from 65 to 118. And as Dr. Seinberg said, I think they're going to continue to rise. Sheriff, what are some of the things you're doing? So I don't know if you can tell or not, but I was nodding approvingly through everything that Chief Balling and also Sheriff Edwards has said, because we're doing exactly the same thing here in Lynn County um, for exactly the same purposes. And one other thing we were able to do, uh, and maybe they're doing it as well, is, you know, we were able to get the court involved immediately and the court get, understood the severity of this situation and the court allowed us the ability uh, so if, if a person is arrested on a simple or serious misdemeanor, no longer are they coming to jail. We're releasing almost all of those people on promises to appear just to keep that flow of inmates away from the county jail. And anyone that runs a jail knows that you, it's very much like a care facility. It's probably not the inmates that are going to have COVID to begin with. It's the transient uh, group. It's, it's your employees. It's the visitors. It's, it's people like that. They're going to bring COVID into the facility. So we have shut down visitation. We have no direct contact between the inmates and the outside world. Even the attorneys have to meet with their clients through the glass, uh, through normal visitation procedures. And quite honestly, they're, they're fine with that. that. That makes sense to them. Um, you know, they, they don't want to, to contract or spread this disease any more than anyone else does. Um, so uh, it sounds like uh, our jail is very similar in size to that of Sheriff Edwards, 400 bed facility, run an average of about 380. Uh, we're also down to about two and a quarter right now because we were able to lessen the number of people coming into the jail, which also allowed us to do social distancing within the jail itself. Um, you know, many, we, we have a, a varying of, of both dormitory and, and lockdown cell um, uh, situations in our building. And so for, in, for inmates that have individual cells, that's all well and good. I mean, they're, they're in their own areas, they can come out as need be. Um, but for the dormitory style cells, you know, one of our larger one has 40 inmates, we needed to establish that social distancing. And so we were able to do that by reducing the number of inmates in that, that particular dorm by spreading them throughout the facility as well. And we also have areas that are more remotely located in the jail we were able to earmark people that may possibly have contracted the disease. Uh, we are fortunate much in the same way that Sheriff Edwards is. I have zero cases of COVID uh, in my jail right now for inmate population. Um, it's been that way from the beginning. Hopefully it stays that way. And only early on did I have three staff members that, that had COVID. Um, they arrived to work well um, through the vetting process, uh, became symptomatic while at work, sent them home immediately, tested them isolated. And thankfully that has not, that occurred back in April and we've had no other um, uh, contractions since that time. So um, I'm doing everything. We're doing everything. The same thing that Chief Balling is doing, same thing that Sheriff Edwards is doing. Um, I think it's just, it's incumbent on agency administrators um, to, to make sure we're doing everything we possibly can to keep our employees and the inmates and the public safe. And, and anything and everything we do, I think, has been well received. People understand the need for, for, for the changes that we have made, and, and it, it's actually, it appears to be working. Right. Well, thank you very much, Sheriff. And, and to kind of close this out, we've got about 
two minutes to go here, but I want to throw it to Dr. Silvio because obviously this is another, it seems like I keep piling stuff on you, Heather. Um, we've got all the work-related stresses and the normal job stresses. Then we've got family and finances. And, and now we throw COVID on top of it. So uh, just, just, you know, in the COVID affects our family, you really talk about, you know, officers I know that are out there and they're, they're big and they're strong and they're tough. And they're like, I'm not going to get COVID. But you know what? I'm really kind of afraid that if I do, I'm going to bring home to my wife or my child or my mother or my husband. That's a huge stressor. And then Dr. Scheinberg for some closing COVID comments to you. So Heather, how do we deal with this other layer now thrown on top of us in law enforcement? And I would actually, not to pile it higher, um, add that there's a heightened level of stress across the entire country right now due to COVID and social unrest. And so officers are going to be lightning rods for some of that. And, and that, that it is going to be natural that that's going to be stressors for them. To speak specifically to the idea of the concern for the family and for family members being worried about their law enforcement officers who are out there potentially being exposed. First is take a deep breath, recognize it, it is perfectly normal to be concerned about that. I think we all have some level of concern about that. And I think that that's normal. Where we wanna be careful is not allowing it to pile on and bury everything else. Both the families and the officers themselves handle all the regular risks. You know the things to do. Your agencies are putting systems in place to help you protect yourselves and to protect your families. So there's two pieces to it. One is follow that guidance and trust that each side will do the best that they can for it. And then recognize that's all that you can do. You may or may not get it. Your family may or may not get it. But, and I don't want to get too far into like statistics or any of that kind of stuff, but it's not any greater of a risk to some degree than any of the other risks that you're already handling. You can do this. You just have to remind yourself that you can. All right, thank you for the positive words, Heather. And John, we've got about 30 seconds left, Dr. Scheinberg. Final comments again, or just repeat, what can the officer do to best protect themselves from being exposed? So it's common sense. It's wear masks. It's come in contact with people and maintain that six foot distance if you can. Avoid people who are known to be infected or exposed without having on the proper protective equipment. It's constant hand sanitizing. It's making sure that the individuals you come in contact with on your own department are every day temperature checked and asked the questions, have you lost taste or smell? Have you had any rashes? Have you had any changes in bowel habits? Are you having a fever? If these things are done, we can mitigate and slow the response, which allows the medical community to catch up. Um, the scary thing about what's happening now is this is the summer and viruses are supposed to be the most dormant in the summer. It's 110 degrees outside, like I said, when we started and we have almost every one of our hospitals filled to the max with COVID patients. So this, we will get through this, this will pass, it will come down. I think there's a good chance that there'll be a vaccine or a better treatment modality on the not too distant horizon, but we just have to get through it and, and uh, like uh, Dr. Silvio said, it is very stressful. The unknown is very stressful. I think that creates you know, a substantial amount of problems. I tell you, as when I'm not wearing my law enforcement uniform and I'm seeing patients as a cardiologist, we're seeing people all day long with chest pain and palpitations because of the stress of the environment. So again, as to echo what she said, be aware of the fact that this is taking its toll on everyone. And uh, my only Word is we'll get through this like we've gotten through every other major catastrophe. It's just going to take a little bit of time and we can do it if we all work together. All right. Thank you, Dr. John Scheinberg, Chief Will Balling, Dr. Heather Silvio, Sheriff Ira Edwards, and Sheriff Brian Gardner for this has been a great the 90 minutes has flown by, but it's time for me to turn it back over to our CEO, Marcia Ferranto. And Marcia, uh, I turn it back over to you and thank everybody for this great panel discussion. Yes, and thank you, John, and thank you to all of our guest speakers for your time, your expertise, your willingness to share. There is no doubt that everyone in this virtual room 
has many tech takeaways after this discussion. So I ask you to mark your calendars and join us on August 10th for our next panel discussion on law enforcement, anti-racism, and implicit bias program. Uh, watch your emails for more information. Lastly, uh, but not least, thank you again to our Destination Zero lead sponsor, Verizon, and to our partners over at BJA. We will see you all in a few weeks. Stay well and stay safe.